Support for this podcast comes from Frito-Lay in the 2023 Snack Bracket Championship. The Frito-Lay Snack a Challenge is underway, and fans are voting on their favorite snacks to crown champion. We're talking about primetime matchups between the best 64 snacks in the land. Will Ruffles Ridges reign supreme? Can Doritos defend their dynasty? Or will Smart Food use their smarts for a surprise upset? Only you can decide. Get in on all the action for a chance to win up to $1,000 or a year's worth of snacks. Let your snacks be heard. Just go to frito to vote and enter for a chance to win. No purchase necessary. Three stakes ends April 3rd, 2023. Void but prohibited. Years worth of snacks awarded in the form of 52 coupons, each good for one bag of chips. See official rules at frito This is the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Now, here are your hosts, Jeff Sharon and Eric Lopez. And we welcome you to this edition of the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. I'm Eric Lopez alongside Bryce Turner. We're here at the UCF Softball Complex. As we record this, UCF is practicing, getting set for the regionals. It will begin this weekend in Orlando, the first time ever that UCF is hosting a regional. Coming up on this edition of the Banneret Podcast, we're going to air the interview that you had, Bryson, on Wednesday with Stephanie Best, the Hall of Famer, the first ever recruit here, who saw her RBI record broken by Jada Cody on Saturday in the American title game. And I know she's very proud of this team and Jada, right? Oh, yes, she very much is. She's also extremely proud of Coach uh, Cindy Ball Malone as well, and we will be able to get to that into our interview. But it's great to be out here on location at the softball complex watching the players practice live, and you'll be able to hear some of it with us. But one of the reasons why they're practicing right now, Eric, is because they had a lightning delay, and it seems that weather is going to be playing a factor with UCF sports this week. Baseball's already moved right. its you schedule gotta, yeah. up to be have a double header to on Thursday. So uh, what, what, what have you been seeing on that? Well, you know, that's a big question, obviously with the weather forecast, will it get better or not? You can't control that. I know you're going to get into that with Jeff. We'll join the show later to talk about baseball's last weekend against Cincinnati before the conference tournament in Clearwater. But uh, among other sports, of course, UCF softball, not the only one winning conference championships, track and field. You guys will talk about as well as rowing coming up short in their championship and all that coming up on this edition of the Black and Go Better at Podcast. Where can they follow us, Bryson? You can follow me at at it's Bryson Turner on Twitter. You can follow Eric at at Eric Lopez Elo. And of course, you can follow all of our articles from both me, Jeff, Eric, Eric, Kyle Nash, on the and Andrew Glukov on at UCF Banneret underscore SBN. All right, let's talk here, Bryce. We are here at the complex. Give a, the, let's talk about the perspective here. They're still constructing. Uh, they've added some bleachers uh, over behind the, the home dugout over at third base. Give me your thoughts here. What's it like when you walked in here? You see all the logos of the four teams. You got the NCAA logo over here. It's, it's, it's getting real here, right? Like this, this is obviously as a result, UCF getting the 16 seed. On Sunday night, an incredible moment. If you go to our YouTube page, you can see all the reactions from Sunday night and a genuine emotion uh, reactions. But now it's getting time up close to reality here. What, 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 what's kind of jumped out at you here being here right now? I am very impressed at how this site has transformed itself to host the regional. Looking at the bleachers, um, they uh, they basically have erected a temp- some temporary bleachers above the home team dugout and look looking at it right now i could i would estimate that it could hold a good double a good solid amount of people uh, which of course is excellent because uh the the seating capacity is definitely something that i would imagine would would be a concern and so having those extra seats there is great they have standing room only available out in left field they had cordoned cordoned it off a bit up to the wall so that way we can get some more people there and then they have some more uh, bleachers out in the right field section so they're slowly but surely this complex is really transforming into a one that can hold a regional game they have an extra set of restrooms out in a trailer beyond right field they have the media tent behind us who we are sitting in the radio press box right now where actually where you eric 
are going to be broadcasting the game via Twitch as, as long as we don't play South Dakota State, that is. Yeah, I'll be in the uh, visiting press box. ESPN will have my regular press box. Tyler Denning and uh, Nicole Mendez will have the broadcast. ESPN brings their own people for the uh, postseason. So I'll be doing back uh, the old throwback, doing radio uh, on Twitch, as you mentioned. Uh, and then I'll be outside when we play South Dakota State, literally underneath here, this press box. Hopefully weather will cooperate. We don't know. But uh, this is a stacked regional, right? So I'm going to break down the regional real quick. Michigan's the two seed. They got two All-American pitchers and Alex Duraco, Megan Bobian, Carol Hutchins, the legendary head coach, the all-time leader in wins. In Division One, you got South Dakota State is the two-time defending Summit uh, Summit League champions. They got Grace Glancer and Tori Kanishi, the two top pitchers for them. Uh, Krista Wood is their head coach, has done a great job. She's another coach on the rise. And then Villanova is UCF's first opponent, Bridget Orchard and the Wildcats, back for a second year in the tournament. They got Paige Rowell, who's one of the best two-way players in the country. So that's a very stacked regional Bryson, seeing some of the softball media and experts picks right now, I think Michigan's been the trendy pick, but I think UCF doesn't care about that. I think they're just locked in. They got some unfinished business in this region, but they certainly did not do it. Uh, they didn't get any favors. They got a stacked regional, which is what you would expect from a 16 seed. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can understand Michigan being the trendy pick because both teams did play each other back earlier in the season in St. Pete and Clearwater. But and they and of course, UCF was shut out six to nothing in that game. But I think the big difference maker that between that game and, and what will likely happen if UCF and Michigan uh, come go against each other in this regional is that the previous game had fre freshman Caitlin Felton in the circle to start. And while she is an excellent freshman pitcher, she is still a freshman and she showed and it ended up being that ended up show, showcasing that against Michigan. But for the regional, you're going to have the, your two top pitchers available, whether it's Gianna Mancha or Kama Woodall. And I have to imagine that'll be a big difference if these teams end up going up against each other for the second time this season. It is a very stacked pitching staff regional. It's one of the top three regionals when it comes to ERA among pit, uh, the whole four teams combined. So I think runs could be at a premium. Uh, timely hitting will be very important. Let's play some of the clips. You, you and I, Bryce, along with other local media, had a chance to catch up with Coach Paul Malone uh, during, uh, after practice on Wednesday. Here's what Coach Paul Malone had some of the things to say about hosting and some of the uh, Lenovo as well as just uh, this, this week that is. It's sunk in a little bit more now that you're practicing and getting ready to host UCS very first regional. Yeah, you know what? Actually, uh, ironically, we've had more practices, I think, this week than we've had in a long time. But um, just having all of our um, employees here and our staff getting our pl the Plex ready, is it's exciting. It's fun. The girls have smiles on their face. They love seeing all the NCAA stuff go up and the bleachers go up. And so um, it's, it's a fun time. What's the challenge in shifting from the enthusiasm to practicing and taking this serious this week? Yeah, um, you know, we, we've had some good practices, like I said, and just the ability to have that time um, and less travel time and, and whatnot. But um, we've had those talks of like, we're gonna take a second, we're gonna check it all out. And then a big thing for us is we love the arena, not the attention. Um, and so sometimes we, we get away from that, especially with all of the things that are going on this week. And so we just remind our, ourselves and get back together, you know, that we have our pre-practice meetings and we've just been talking about like what's gotten us here and where we want to keep going. And um, I asked them again, like, okay, you guys, you're hosting a regional. That was one of our goals. I mean, we can just say like, okay, good, let's just play. And they said, no, we've got some more goals. And so we talked about those and you know, we got after it in our light and delayed practice, um, just working real hard in the cages right now. What's the scouting report on Villanova? I know they didn't give up a run at all in their conference tournament. Yeah, yeah. So their pitcher was hot um, as far as, you know, in the circle. And uh, and I think that that's, that's huge. She's a great two-way player. Um, you know, they've, they've played here before. Uh, they put some runs up against us and, and got the game into a, like a pretty close game. I think it was seven to three, but they had some runners on with a big hitter up. So um, I think really for us, it's just playing our game, uh, putting the game in motion and you know, letting our offense work for us. Sunday night, Gianna said, it'd be nice to sleep in her own bed all week. <laughs> Talk about the importance yeah. of that home field advantage. Yeah, you know, um, that is huge. It, it has been nice to sleep in our own beds. Um, but, you know, as a coach, I, to I told them, because there's a 
quick turnaround on these some of these days and these games and I said the perfect world is we're in a hotel we get to meet and stay together and um, you know get get to bed at a certain time and make sure we're doing all of that but I want them to enjoy this and so we just talk about what really good decisions are in this moment in these moments we have a lot of family coming out and so you know they're on board too to make sure that we stay in our routine but um, you know outside of that sleeping in your own bed is always good you heard about the demand for tickets obviously it sold out really yeah. quickly are you hearing it from alums and everyone that wants to be here yeah you know we're hearing it from you know the other teams um alum alums as well you know it's it's an awesome feeling to i, I don't even know how how long it was up for um but i see like okay tickets are going up on tuesday and they're already sold out like, what holy cow so um it's awesome what they're doing to put more seating out uh, i know we have a standing room only in left field that's going to be exciting and um, I mean can't say enough about Night Nation and I think you're going to see a lot of black and gold in the stands. Helps make the case for renovations and continued improvements here? <laughs> yes, yes. Well what's cool is our, our administration and you know you, you got to see Coach Z out here and um, our SWA um, Abby and our AD Terry they've been talking about it. They know um, that they want to do those things. They've, they're the ones saying it and um, I think this is just one step moving in that direction. They're bought into what we're doing here. They want this to be a traditional thing. And so it, it's exciting and, you know, we'll, we'll keep taking notes and writing things down and getting better every time. Coach, you mentioned, on, you mentioned that hosting the regionals was a goal for the team before the season even started. How important was that to even have that then? And then I got to ask, what are the goals coming out of this weekend? Yeah, yeah. So, um, well, as far as this goal of hosting, a lot of it came down to scheduling. And so we this has been something we've done the last couple of years. Our schedules have been pretty intense. Um, and, you know, the elephant in the room, we graduate Aaliyah White and some of our power, um, our, our home run power, and you think, okay, you put up this crazy schedule, what are you thinking? But um, we, we get, we, we talk about leaving it better than you found it. And that senior class left it in a really good spot. And we brought some good freshmen in and couple good transfers so um, you know just having having that be a goal and an everyday language and it coming from the team you know we may have sparked the idea a couple years ago but it's been something that they've, they've kept in their minds um, and then as far as our goals moving forward you know we're gonna play one pitch at a time one game at a time but our, our forward vision is getting to the super regionals and then the next step like they, they want to play in until the last game is played in NCAA softball Coach, have you talked to anyone about the weather forecast for this weekend? Baseball has just moved up. They're scheduled to play a doubleheader on Thursday. So have you had a chance to look at that yet? We haven't talked about that. That's kind of out of our hands. They, you know, we'll have our meeting tomorrow um, because teams are just traveling in today and practice schedule is for tomorrow. And, uh, you know, we'll leave it to um, the regional directors and, you know, the people that above our pay grades in those, in those environments to make those decisions. So... I, I feel good that they'll do whatever they need to do to make the, the regional run well. Obviously hosting a regional going to the Big 12 next year, how does that continued development help from a recruiting standpoint? Yeah, recruiting has been awesome. You know, we have our, our recruits that are committed, um, signed and, and what have you, and they're happy um, and proud to be a Knight. And um, it, I mean, it's, some, it's the pitch we gave to them, you know, when I said I was coming here and I, I told the administration, all right, well, you know, five years, we're, we'll host a, a regional. Um, and so, like I said, this group's not as patient, and so they did it in four. Um, and so uh, it, it just helps with the brand that we're talking about with our game, um, with our program, and really speaks to our culture. I mean, um, if, if you look at the team that we have and, like, how we go about things, it might be a little different than others, but our culture is huge. Um, it's very important to me and um, we talk about like okay you can get here doing it this way and being team oriented and what, like, what's the confidence level right now with the players yeah <laughs> we <laughs> we have to bring them down a bit no i'm just kidding no it, they're confident you know and what's awesome about them is they're also great human beings and so um i think they they have the opportunity to um walk the talk and you know we we talk about this group. Um, they're very popular at our football games. Like we have this section, section 102, and we talk about that. And they wear the flashiest outfits and 
everything else. And so that's really been something we've talked about as a group is like, that's how you need to act out there. Right. And so they're, they're walking it and I love it. They've got their chins high they're They've got their smiles on and they're ready to roll. In what ways is your team different than when you played Michigan earlier this year? Oh gosh, very different. <laughs> um, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to say, especially our shortstop Lala Macario. I mean, um, this team put a lot of balls in play towards her and, um, I think if she could have that game back, like I haven't even talked to her personally about it, but that week in St. Pete really defined what Lala was going to be about. Like it was a tough week, um, tougher playing surface, uh, a lot of balls hopped her way. And, you know, the next week she makes uh, Sports Center um, top 10 plays and she's just really turned it on since then. And so I think that was a huge defining moment and it really happened in that Texas game for her. Um, so I think that's a huge one for me. Um, our pitchers, you know, I didn't throw Gianna a lot um, in that week. She was kind of um, had like a little nagging deal um, starting earlier in the year. Um, and so we kind of rested her and, and it, it really went in our favor, maybe not in that week, but later on in the season. And so um, I would just say our team is learned from it definitely um, they talk about it being one of the toughest moments and I was like it was literally six games guys it's not that big of a deal but for them losing four games out of six is like they don't do it often here and so um, it, it meant more to this program than I, I even imagined and realized like they got after it in their lonely work um, and then they saw okay these are the things we need to do to be able to perform and compete at that level Coach Emma Hutchins, obviously in this region, the all-time leader in wins in Division One. What has she meant to you from a coaching perspective, and how well do you know her? Did you compete against her when you were a player against her? Sure. So um, as a player, played against her um, when she was coaching, because um, and just the utmost respect for her. You know, she's like you said, the winningest coach out there, and um, her teams, just the way that they perform in postseason, are awesome. I mean, she got her team to really. Uh, put it to Washington and they had to you know do some tough stuff last year um, to get through that regional and so I it just speaks to what she's done with that program time in and time out I mean it's been a winning program for many many years ever since I can remember um, and then on top of it like I like to pride myself for being a player's coach and kind of being hip and she's got some good TikToks out there so <laughs> I'm going to say, like, I, I feel like I try to compete with her, and I even told her at one of our recruiting events, like, hey, you got to slow down. Like, you're making us, like, look bad, you know. You're, you're doing that, and this is, you know, closer to my generation of things, and I've, I'm trying to keep up with you. But she just laughed and said that we all should do one together as a coach, like all the coaches recruiting out there. So, um, but, yeah, it, awesome woman in our sport, um, just has done some amazing things, and, you know, she just keeps going. So it's – like just to see someone win that, you know, that many years, like she's doing a lot of good things and a lot of things right. This is a star-studded pitching staff regional. I mean, it's one of the top three in the country uh, as far as regionals pitching wise. Villanova's got Paige Rout. South Dakota State's got a couple of, you know, call conference pitcher of the years. Big Michigan has the two All-Americans. We got the staff. You've talked about efficient offense. This is what it's about, isn't it? In the regionals, being efficient offensively because you're not going to get a ton of opportunities against great pitching. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I knew it was good, but you know that sounds even <laughs> even tougher to hit. But no, um, I mean that's what it comes down to in postseason. You're going to have pitchers that have incredible movement, good off speeds, and then hitters that you know come out of those regionals are the they have the ability to hit the off speed, they have the ability to lay off the rise ball, um, and and put the ball in play. And it, it might come down to a bunt, it might come down to a sacrifice fly, it may come down to just putting pressure on defense. And so. Um, I think you're going to see a lot of that in, in the games here with all of the teams. They all have a little bit of power. They all have, some of them have speed. And like you said, all of them have great pitching staff. Coach Gasso complimented you. said you played a great schedule. You earned the seat. A lot of people in the softball world complimented you and really happy for you. So what does that make you feel that really the softball community is happy for you and happy for the UCF program to get this opportunity? Yeah, just hearing people talk about it, I mean, um, I, I think the committee did it, and I, I'm not just saying this because I'm at UCF and we're hosting, but the committee did a really good job with this bracket. I mean, it's there's a lot of parity in it. And, um, I, to hear people talk about, you know, wanting it to be that way and, and 
um, I guess, rewarding people that are doing like the whole body of work, like like they've been saying. Um, it, it's just a great feeling to to have and to know that you know we have that support out in the, the community, and it's it's not just like who it is and where it is, but you know it, it's going to the, the team that earns it and deserves it. Coach, I was talking to one of this program's alumni earlier today, and she talked about actually how you like you, how you know the RPI and how you know and, and you assemble a schedule that can help reward that. And so, just following up on what Elo said, how prepared do you feel like this team is now that they've been through the schedule that you such a schedule that you've assembled, including like one game against Michigan, and now they're yeah. in regional. Yeah, well, um, there. I mean, there's a lot of math that goes into it with those like the three year RPI and like. Because you have a team that can be down one year or up one year, and um, I mean, we just we, we've been blessed um, in having somebody that was involved with the committee, a part of our um, athletic department in in years past, that would come and teach our athletes what that meant. And so, you know, I think the biggest thing that you know would happen here sometimes, and it even happened in my first year, we'd have like a really good win, right? We'd, we'd beat Ohio State, and then um, the next game we wouldn't come out and play the the, the game that we needed to play. And on paper, we're supposed to win that game. And what does that mean anymore? Like anybody can beat anybody on any given day. The game does not know. But um, they've just done a really good job of understanding every game matters, right? And <laughs> probably too much. Like they'll talk about what, what's this RPI? And I'm like, just go play the game. We're playing Sally, you know? And so, but for them to understand that and know that and know the process that it takes because to be us and host a regional for the very first time, you know, we had to break through some of that stuff. And so we had to know those things. We had to talk about those things. Um, and we have some very smart individuals. I just got done watching right before practice, Jada Cody's um, TikTok. And all of them are talking about like, well, we have the RPI, we've done the work. I'm like, I don't even know if I knew what RPI was when I played. An RBI maybe, that's what I knew, you know? So. Um, it's just interesting how they can be students of the game, how mature they are, and we can talk about those things, and they can still play as free as they do. A lot of the alumni is coming in this weekend, like Shelby Trainer says, she was in tears when the UCF name came up. Coach Gillespie texted me to congratulate. She got in tears because for this program, it's always been, well, you're going to go to Gainesville, Tallahassee. What is it? Did you see this vision when you came here that this was possible? What was it that you saw? Yeah, I mean... I, I'm not gonna lie, like honestly, and I'm in a point like when I came out here to check out this this school and decide, am I gonna move my family across the country? Because never in a million years would you would I ever think that I was gonna live in Florida and move away from my entire family, right? And the stadium was closed. We we got dropped off at the hotel and we got our rental car and we sat out in that right field over there. And I just said, I need a moment. And I just went out and I, I'm checking out the stadium and seeing and I'm like okay have it have the vision have the big picture like what's this place gonna look like in five years what are you gonna be able to do here in ten years and I saw it right and um, you know we're in Orlando it's it's the most visited city in the nation it's the, the I think one of the biggest growing cities in the nation and so um, you get on campus it recruits itself right um, but just the program like I didn't come here and have to like totally rebuild this program. It was left with a Leah White in the circle. And, and that was my first question, who's the pitcher, right? And doing my homework, I'm like, okay, yeah, I can win a lot of games still with, with that. And, um, and so, you know, Coach G did such a good job in her time here um, of, of putting this place on the map and, and, and doing what she did. And so for me, it was, you know, being able to take pride and like, again, she left it in, in a good spot and then now like adding maybe like a little bit of my spice or seasoning to it and now we've got a real good like pasta dish I guess with some good spaghetti sauce but <laughs> um, but it's it, you know our alum like just the amount of people that text me and um, just the support that we've had throughout the year we've had so many people come out and watch us you know you have Natalie Land up in, at ECU um, just coming out on the field and seeing us with our trophy you got Mackenzie Otis that was at the USF series you got you know Allison Kime that was there as well and um, I'm sorry I'm not using their married names I'm using more of their their softball names but there's so many more you know you got the Avari sisters that have come out um, I got to meet the first pitching uh, two-way pitcher here Dottie Cup right so 
yeah so it's it's just been awesome and then stuff fest like I, like i'm not even mentioning like you know the person that jada cody has been been chasing right um it's just there, there's so many of them and i know that i haven't been able to mention all of them like you mentioned shelby's going to come out um as well it's it's just awesome to have all those big names and, and know that we were able to make them proud. And and that was what I told them, like, our goal is for, for you guys to be in that front row in Oklahoma City acting like crazy fools and getting on ESPN. Like, that's our goal. And that's that's our goal for, for you to be proud of this program and be a, still be proud to be a part of Night Nation. Perfect. Thank you, Coach. All right. That was uh, head coach, Sidney Balmalone, earlier today from media availability. What was your thoughts on what Coach Balmalone had to say? I mean, I think that she is just ready to host this regional, Eric. I mean, this is something that, you know, she really knows how this R- the RPI system works. She assembled this schedule so that way this team has the opportunity, had the opportunity to host, and she has done it. I mean, for all intents and purposes, even, even without a, a game having been played yet in this regional, this is one of the most successful seasons in UCF softball history. But now – you, you now you it's, it's time to leave it out leave it all out there on the field you have a potential rematch with Michigan you have of course South Dakota State and Villanova who are as you as you talked about are great teams in their own right so I think that as long as weather uh, regardless of what the weather forecast holds which Bob Malone also talked about a little bit I think that they're just ready to play and they and they're excited to play and I think that's going to be a very important factor. They, they, the motivation is there. The passion is there. And I think, if anything, that's going to be a big reason that if UCF advances out of this regional, it'll be a big, that'll be a big reason as to why. All right, no question about the passion. And this softball NCAA tournament has so much passion. It's so popular. It's grown. It's huge on social media, on television. That's why this, to me, Bryson, this is the biggest NCAA tournament event that's ever been hosted by UCF. You know, you, you know, with all res- due respect to men's soccer, women's soccer and volleyball, those tournaments are now nowhere near the radar of softball. Those sports uh, are usually on NCAA.com for the region, you know, the first couple of rounds. This sport is on ESPN Linears through, uh, throughout from the get-go. And it, it's the really, a ma- na- to me, outside of, obviously you got football aside, outside of March Madness and men's basketball, there's no other sport that draws the interest on social media, on television, and as softball does. And UCF's a big part of that. And I think this is a huge, huge week for UCF on and off the field. We'll, we don't know what's going to happen on the field. We'll talk about that at, at the end of this segment. But off the field, Bryson, this is a changing moment for the program. I think you're going to see a big push for renovations uh, moving forward because it used to be, yeah, sure, we'll do renovations, but you guys aren't going to host in the state. They're never going to have three teams in the state. Well, that's done now. Now they can host. They're going to the Big 12. And I think this is going to push renovations for softball. And I think it's going to push the interest. And, and it's just going to, it's a huge, that we'll look back five, 10, 20 years from now. We're going to say this team's legacy is they raised the bar of this program, not only on the field, but off the field with the facilities and everything. Oh, yes, I would agree with that. I mean, look, I mean, we, we you know, you guys talked about it with Terry Mohajer yeah. the other week. You, you know, football might be the main priority because that's the main moneymaker. But I think with this regional softball has made the perfect case about why it should be the number two place that the, the athletic department looks when, you know, develop when figuring out which facilities to really focus on. Uh, focus absolutely. On next. Absolutely. I think the spring sports, this, they were 22nd in attendance this year uh, in the country. When it comes to that, the, the interest in the broadcast has been very big. Uh, social media, this was the, this team was trending the most on Selection Sunday. It was trending more than Oklahoma. It's trending in more than other teams. So I 100% agree with you on that. And the person that I think has to be smiling with a big smile watching all this unfold is Stephanie Best, UCF's All Athletic Hall of Famer, the first ever recruit here, Bryson, over 20 years ago, the program, and I uh, you know you had a chance to talk to her. Yes, indeed, I did, Eric. It was amazing to get the chance to speak with her. It's a little rare. I, I talked about this with her a little after we finished recording, that um, that I don't normally get to speak with, you know, the 
notable historic legendary alumni of a program and they did their athletic achievements during my lifetime this program started in 2002 and i was born in 2000 so with stephanie best being their first commit her playing days occurred in, dur during my lifetime which is something i normally don't get to do as a sports reporter so getting the chance to be to speak to stephanie best and talking about you know how her thoughts on this team her thoughts on Jada Cody, who just broke her record. It, it was an amazing conversation. So let's go ahead and go to that one right now. All right, Miss Best, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with me today. So I just want to go ahead and get your, for, your first just reactions. How does it feel to finally see the Plex host a regional? It's incredible, right? This is what, 20 years, 20 plus years in the making. So I think it's awesome. I've, I've rewatched the excitement of the players and how excited they got when uh, UCF's name was called. So I think it's cool. I think it's special. I think everyone knows it's special. You, you know, they literally just made history. So whether it's the current players, alumni are extremely excited. I think the community, Orlando, is excited. So I think it's, uh, it's really cool. They've earned it. You know what I mean? So I think it's awesome. Now, you were the first commit when UCF softball was first uh, formed back in the early 2000s, right? Or when, when did you exactly do that? Yeah, no good question. My senior year of high school was 2000, 2001. Uh, and that's when I committed in November um, of 2000, I believe. And then 2001, that was my freshman year. Our first official season was 2022, um, spring of 2022. So, yeah. So, been around a long time, first commit. Uh, it was a blank canvas back then. The field wasn't even there. So when I did my recruiting visit, literally the head coach at the time walked me to the top of the basketball arena, pointed out to the woods and said, all right, this is where you'll be playing shortstop if you can picture it. Uh, so I think I've always loved the idea of the blank canvas and just being a part of uh, starting something in a vision. I've always just loved that. So yeah, it's uh, 20 years now. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's pretty amazing. And to think that the 20, it ended up taking pre almost exactly 20 years since the first, the, since the first season in 2002, yeah. that the Knights would host their first regional and then also somebody to finally break your single season RBI record with Jada Cody. Uh, when did you um, so when did you first kind of get wind that she is uh, that she has what it takes to break it? Uh, probably a couple months ago, Elo gave me a heads up and said, Hey, you know, this, this player, she's special. She's coming up on a couple of your records. Uh, and when she told me, when he told me who it was, I was excited. Jada Coda, Jada Cody has actually trained here at pro swings with us a little bit. So I was very familiar with her, loved her work ethic, but I'll be honest. I didn't have a clue of her numbers exactly. Uh, but when he shared what was going on, I was like, wow, this is pretty special. Hardworking kid represents the program nicely. So uh, ever since he shared it, I've been on top of it. And I, I think just kind of rooting her along the way. Like, I love it. I think it's awesome. I think she's a difference maker for the program. Clearly, I think she stands out uh, and someone that's, you know, making that much noise at RBIs and she's doing it in clutch situations. So it's, it's pretty special. I love it. I think it means the program's getting better. The recruits are getting better. So I think it shows a lot for what's ahead for UCF softball. So Jada, so Jada's trained, uh, trained at pro swing. So how, then how did you end up first meeting her? Yeah. So when COVID happened, when COVID hit, uh, and it's probably no surprise when I think of the group of kids that came in when COVID happened a couple years ago, it was, uh, Jada Cody, Jada Cody, Gianna Macha, Justine came with them some. So I think you see the, the players that are really leading the Knights are the players that, again, like there was no excuses even for them during COVID. They wanted to get the work in. They wanted to get better. Uh, so a couple of years ago is when I met each of them. Um, and then Jada came in and did training with Ellie Cooper last summer. She had a big summer, went to a USA tryout. So I think just, again, taking pride in her preparation, wanting to make sure she's doing everything possible to get better and put herself, I think, with great people. Ellie Cooper went to Florida State, but she's probably one of the highest level hitting instructors in the country. Uh, and Jada pursued her to get in to get some extra training in. So it, 
considering that Jada, obviously you're one of the first, you're, you, you were the first commit, which means that this record has been in place since the program started, basically, almost since it was the 2003 season. So what about Jada when, when you got to work with her, or even just when you see her on the field now, what, like this season, what reminds you of you from back in like 2003, back in those times? Uh, well, I mean, first I think she's better, right? She's doing, it, it's cool if you mirror what she's doing as a sophomore and what I did as a sophomore, uh, that was the, my sophomore year is the record that she just broke. So I think it's cool. There's different, definitely some parallels there and similarities. Um, but I think what we probably both have in common, we're hungry, right? Now, it doesn't matter how good we're doing. We're chasing excellence and we want to get better and better and better. So I think if anything, it's just, she's willing to put in the extra work and that's what it takes if you want to be great. So I think that stands out, uh, when she's been in here in the environment, she's very humble. You know, you don't know how good she is by the way she's carrying herself. Um, she's just a hardworking kid that is chasing, doing some special things and working hard. So you mentioned that Gianna Mancha came in to work, uh, work at pro swings with Jada. Um, it did, was that, um, did Jada end up catching her, there, catching her there and were, were they, had they already kind of been pitching and catching to each other before, or did they kind of build that bond while there? Uh, you know, that's a good question. I'm not totally sure. My guess is they've always had a strong relationship when they came in. It was cool. So Jada would obviously catch Gianna and then Jada needed to take ground ball. So then Gianna was hitting her fungo so she can get her ground ball work into her defensive stuff. Um, Gianna would pitch live to her, which is huge to have somebody that can pitch live to you as a difference maker, I think for any elite level players, uh, but with throw a front toss, they were each other's, uh, partner when it came to really helping hold each other accountable, make each other better. And then I think the second year they started coming in is when they started bringing Justine in as well. So then seeing her succeed and do so much good stuff was not a surprise. I'm like, here are the kids that are in here working hard, doing extra you mentioned how you, so you played shortstop. Was that the only position you played in your college career? At UCF, yes. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, so Jade has obviously been getting some time in plenty of different positions, whether it's catching Gianna when she's pitching or third, mainly at third base, but she's kind of gone to other places on the field as well. What do you think stands out to Jade in terms of your, of her fielding versatility? Uh, I think that's where she's super special, you know, that to your point, I, I played shortstop and only shortstop. Uh, it would have been scary if I was thrown in the outfit at any point, but what you're saying, I'm, I think a month ago, mid April, I went to a game and they put her in left field. She caught the first half of the game. Then they put her in left field. Then she, obviously she's a stud when she plays in the infield. So I think Jada is going to play where the team needs her. If Bear says, hey, we need you, our team is best in this scenario. If you're at this position, she's going to make sure that she's qualified and she's going to do a good job for them. So I think that's why she's such a special player. Uh, she can help the team in several ways. So let's go ahead and talk about when she broke the record. So when you first found, like when Elo first told you, about uh, about her approaching your record did he tell you you know like hey you know start watching because it can happen any day like did did you start getting the word that it, it was really close yeah so elo gave me a heads up probably halfway through the season uh and then i came out in april mid-april and uh someone a part of the staff interviewed me um that calls the games and we were talking about it and i was like all right She's on fire right now. My gut, I think she's going to break this record before the end of April, right? So then she had a little bit of a cold streak, and then she was back on fire. So I think UCF did an awesome job, and their marketing team did an awesome job promoting her. So I follow all those accounts. So I think as she was chipping away at it, getting closer and closer, I was able to see it based on how well UCF was marketing uh, this when they were saying chasing the best and then caught the best, and then now she is the best, like, I thought that was really cool, really cool campaign. Uh, and I, I just think it was amazing. I knew she was going to do it this year. It was just a matter of time. And then, God, when it happens and she's literally, that's probably one of the most important statistics offensively, right? It's great if you hit home runs. It's great if you have a good batting average. If 
but RBIs is about like your production. It's about scoring runs. Those are productive at bats that are, they're genuinely helping your team win ball games. So I think that's, I mean, the fact that she uh, is now the best, she has and holds that record. Uh, I think it's awesome. It's funny because she both caught you in one game and then bested you in the other game. And both of them occurred in the conference tournament in Greenville, North Carolina, which we checked. And I believe you're from the uh, from, from a, for, Fort Mill around the Charlotte area, right? Yep, exactly. So that is probably the closest that she could get to because that's about because uh, Greenville's about a four hour drive ish from Charlotte. So that's about as close as you can get to where you're originally from and that's where she both caught you and then beat you beat you did when you I mean I don't know just thoughts on that yeah no it's awesome I think that's cool the similarities are cool to me what was so special is the night before I saw that she caught the record and I was like oh my gosh and they're going into the championship and I'm like she's gonna hit a walk off she's gonna make history she's gonna break this record I was like fantasizing and visualizing she's going to have this massive walk-off like how Shannon does you know and it's going to be breaking the record and she's going to do it to win the title so the night before I knew it was going to happen and my I just visualized home run this is how it's going to happen uh and it did she just did it sooner the team was on fire their offense was ridiculous obviously in the championship game so I thought, golly, not only did she break the record, she did it when it mattered. I have no clue when the 66 mark came for me. I don't know exactly what was going on in that scenario. But what I know for Jada Cody is she did it by propelling her team and securing a conference title. So I think if you're a player that's uh, chasing history and breaking records, my gosh, she did it on the biggest stage, you know, at that point. So now it's going to be interesting to see what she does in postseason play. So did you, um, so now she, of course she has 69, a very nice total, if I do say so myself. And so do you think that she'd be able to break 70 because she, yeah. now she could be the first Knights softball player to ever do that? Her, yeah, I was saying, I think uh, 100%, I think she's going to hit 70. I think she's going to surpass it. I think players like Jada Cody rise to the occasion. Uh, and I'm excited to see what she does for the team weekend and the first ever regional. So I think she's going to, I think she's going to hit 70, but I think she's going to go past that. So what, so what do you think, like, cause uh, you know, coach bear calls this team team 21. So what is it about Team 21 that since they are the first team in 20 years to mm -hmm. host a regional? What do you think is different about that team? Because obviously you being the one of the like one of the one of the founding mothers of the this softball program, you know, you I, I've been around. I, I imagine that you've obviously come back to plenty of games since you began so in the in this 20 year history what about team 21 is kind of different that has helped them propel to the heights that they've reached uh bear i think the head coach is a difference maker i think she understands postseason um i think she's done an awesome job with bringing in great softball players ucf has always had great athletes um, but I think she's done a really nice job complementing what we've already done, how we've built the foundation of bringing in uh, solid softball players, high IQ softball players. Uh, and I think, too, she's a difference maker because she understands postseason in a sense of RPI, right? Like it was huge of how she built the schedule because that's why we're hosting a regional. You know what I mean? We could have had an easier schedule, but she was intentional about getting quality wins against ranked teams because the importance of being one of the top 16 teams in the RPI ranking. So I think there is a difference maker. She set up the schedule to give us the best possible chance to host a regional. And I think she proved to do a nice job. I think uh, she's educated the kids on how important wins are um in those big moments so I think that's a big part of it too so they've performed when it mattered and it put them in a position to get to host you've seen this program I mean you you said it in the beginning that you were there wasn't even a field built yet when yeah. you first commit so you literally saw this program get this this stadium essentially get built from the ground up 
So what does it feel like to you now to have seen all that happen to where, to where it is now? What about the growth of this program? Do you, do you, does it, does it feel special to witness? I guess. Yeah. I mean, you just said the key word it's growth. I don't, I don't know how familiar you are, but back in the beginning, we, our field was at a completely different location. So our field was built beside the basketball arena and the baseball field. It's now since been torn down and it's a parking garage there now um, where the towers are. So I think uh, first it was a vision, then they had a field. The field was beautiful. I think the field's great. UCF is one of the best in the country. Uh, so we played there. And then as we've elevated and moved in conferences, they've now like softball has their own little island. It's awesome. So they, they obviously have plans to grow. Plans to the point, growth, opportunity, I think is what UCF stands for. And they're, they continue to make initiatives, even what you said in the beginning of this conversation, hosting this regional and seeing how we're gonna be busting at the seams in the stadium, like that tells us, let's continue to invest in softball at the University of Central Florida, right? If you, if you build it, they will come, that happen, right? A lot of players bought into that. Now the program has advanced, it's grown, there's so much opportunity. Now we're at a really pivotal point where we can uh, truly invest in stadium, scoreboard, housing, having opportunity to house more people. So we have opportunity to host regionals, super regionals when that time comes. Do you think that the, this program's rise because uh, has coincided with the rise of, of the sport itself? Because obviously you operate, you op now operate a company that that you know trains softball players, and you know, Elo's been talking to me about how softball ratings have definitely gone up in recent years, especially with the help of ESPN Plus being able to broadcast it more. But um, what do you think about uh, like coincides with the rise of UCF softball with the sport itself? Yeah, completely agree. I think for the last 10 years, especially, it's been the fastest growing sport, women's sport. So I think UCF is mirroring kind of the growth and what's going on. And if you look around the country, uh, the program, the facilities are unreal. So it shows you people are investing in uh, programs, women's sports. So I think, yeah, UCF's doing a nice job. We're going to continue to support our community, I think, as a whole loves best pitch softball uh it's a great place to be so i think ucf believes in that uh and they're showing that by the people they're bringing in right i think a lot of times you've got you have to build things around the right people uh and bring someone like bear into the program is a difference maker right and then now you're seeing the type of players she's recruiting uh so it's only going to get better you know you see what jada cody is doing she's going to break this record you know She's going to continue doing big things for the program and everybody that bears bringing in. Uh, so the growth is uh, it's unanimous, I think, with uh, what's going on with the university itself too, the athletics program at UCF. So how does it feel for you feel to you now because that you you know that you that you have seen this program essentially from the very start? Like how special does that feel for you? That was awesome. That's why I can't wait. Uh, you know, if you're in Florida, you know of UCF. The world does not know of UCF, though. Unless you followed football, then you know of Dante Culpepper and the special players that have come after him. Um, but as far as softball on TV, I think people are in for a show. I think I cannot wait to see some of the matchups this weekend, uh, and especially that are going to be televised. UCF's a special team. It's like the uh, the fairy tale of JMU last year, you know, it's it's visibility and that helped them and it got to share their story and how special Odyssey was and the players on the team. So I think for UCF, this is a really cool opportunity. It's time to share our story. It's time to share our fairy tale and who we are as a university and how special the nights are. So I'm excited. Are you gonna get it? Are you gonna make it? Try to make it out to any of the regional games? Absolutely. Yeah, I got my tickets. Uh, Got my ticket and parking the last couple of days. So, and then the staff, we're all going as a staff together. And then several of the alumni uh, we're going to meet up with. And I think just try to share the experience together and cheer on the nights. Awesome. Well, I can't wait to see you out there at the Plex this weekend. And yep. uh, thank you for talking with me. Thank you so much to Stephanie Best for agreeing to talk with me, talk with me. 
And I hope I can't wait to hopefully see her at this regional, Eric. And you, you, talked, you talked about a lot of alumni are coming. She mentioned, uh, uh, she, I know she definitely <laughs> mentioned after we were recording that I believe Shelby uh, Turnier is also coming. There is. Mackenzie Otis, a ton are coming. I've lost track of how many. It's going to be a special atmosphere here. Hopefully the weather cooperates. We'll see about that. But uh, man, I'm super. She's gonna be. She's so excited. As many of the alums are, they couldn't. They some of them never thought this day would come. They were, or they always thought they were destined to go to Florida, Florida State, and what is it? I mean, this state right now, Florida, Florida State, UCF, all hosting uh, regionals. South Florida's Georgina Court was named top three finalist for Player of the Year. That tells you how stacked this state is. This state's a softball school, no question about it. All right, here's my thoughts, Bryce, and real quick as we wrap up from here at the complex. Timely hitting. You talk about efficient offense. That's going to be a key here. You got great pitching all across these four teams. Can't leave runners on base. When you got runners in score position, you've got to knock them in because I think that's going to be at a premium in this regional. You're not going to get a ton of those opportunities. And I think UCF's versatility of scoring in many different ways has to be key here. They have to click. They clicked against South Florida. I think they got to deliver. They, this crowd can help them against the stacked teams like Michigan and Villanova. Play their game. It's, don't worry, you know, worry about what you can control. But I think the team that hits the best with runners in scoring position will end up winning this regional. And I think this regional can be won. Uh, uh, this is a wide open regional. I, I think it's that good. Uh, so, you know, hopefully you see if that's the key for them. But I think you're going to see a lot of mantra and Woodall in this regional. Also, stay on the winner's bracket. I know it sounds very uh, obvious, but with the weather being uncertain, this turn regional is going to end by Monday, one way or the other. And you want to make sure you're on the right side of that regional on the winner's bracket side. If you're UCF, because you're the high seed, you don't want to be caught if this regional can't be finished. Hopefully it doesn't get to that point, but stay on the winner's bracket. Because if you lose a game early, it's a long ways back to get to that regional final. And it's a huge edge for the team that's there. So those, that's the big key. Yeah, very much so. I agree with that, Eric. So as we wrap up here at the complex, I'm very excited to see this. Hopefully we could maybe see Jada Cody break 70 yeah. RBIs in this season. That's going to be fun. Shannon Doherty, of course, will have the opportunity for another big game series as well. I, I can't wait for this for this regional. And I imagine you you are even more, infinitely more so than I am as well. Looking forward to it. I'm going to save my voice. So you and Jeff will take over the rest of the show. And when we come back, you two will talk some baseball. They get ready for the conference tournament in Clearwater. You're listening to the Black and Gold Banneret Podcast. Today's episode is brought to you by Cars.com. With over 2 million vehicles and 50,000 more added every day, Cars.com will match you with the perfect car for you, your budget, your life, your style. And if you're ready to say goodbye to your current car, Cars.com will get you an instant offer to cash it in. Just start by entering your license plate and get matched with a local dealer who will write you the check. So whether you're looking to buy or sell, just go to cars.com. It's magical. All right. Welcome back to the Black and Gold Banneret podcast. Eric Lopez is not with us. I am not Eric Lopez. I'm Jeff Sharon. Uh, back with me, who has on, on foot come back from the from the Plex back to his apartment, is uh, Bryson Turner now joining us. Uh, we're recording this segment on uh Wednesday, Bryson, you look exhausted from running around all day. Yes, it was it was quite nice though being able to. Uh, Eric said that this was the first time that we that you guys had a, we had had a segment for the podcast recorded on location since right. COVID started. So I felt yeah. very privileged. I got to be a part of that, even though it was very hot outside. And uh, it was it was nice to see how the Plex was transforming as, as as a stadium to host an NCAA regional. I can't wait to see it in action. Hopefully, weather permitting. Yeah. Um, th well, that's always the key, isn't it? Weather permitting. I, I I've been seeing the photos um, of the first of all, a couple of things on softball that I wanted to get out there too. Great on the use on the fans out there for selling out the regional as quickly as they did. I mean, that's just fantastic. And that's how you encourage the NCAA to host more regionals in Orlando is with that demand. And uh, it's also, you know, if you're Cindy Ball Malone, um, you know, it's a little bit encouraging to see, you know, hey, maybe we can get some, you know, ballpark expansion coming up, maybe add some more seats so we can, you know, more permanent seats rather, so we can uh, uh, have larger crowds at the Plex when we get to the Big 12. The other thing I, I, I wanted to get in there, 
And, um, you know, and, and I'm glad you guys, you know, it was so good listening to that first segment with you guys out there is, you know, I, I don't know if, if a lot of our fans know, especially a lot of the people who listen to this podcast know this, I've been covering in some way or another UCF softball since its very first season in 2002. Um, when Renee Lewis Gillespie founded the program, Stephanie Best, who you guys talked to in the first segment, was a freshman along with myself. And um, and it was our, to, the fall of, two, or excuse me, the spring of 2002 was the first season of UCF softball. And I was lucky enough to be asked to cover that. And I did a lot of play-by-play -play over my four years as a student there for our first four seasons of softball. Saw a lot of great moments, saw a lot of great players. And, um, and was on hand for our first conference championship. Uh, and it was just such a, it, it felt like climbing Mount Everest just to get that, right, in the Atlantic Sun Conference. And to see now, 20 years on um, from, from that, from that spring, the spring of 2002, and we're now in the spring of 2022, to now see UCF host an NCAA softball tournament regional is just a, uh, it's, it's a remarkable moment. It really makes me reflect on, you know, the good, the good times that I had as a student, um, the relationships that, you know, I, that, you know, still continue to this day. You know, I, I still, you know, if I go to it, you know, I go to UCF softball game, I see some alumni there, you know, from, from the older teams, I recognize them. You know, we talk, we, you know, we talk about the old times and, um, and, and I can't imagine how they must feel, you know, seeing this come to fruition. Cause I know that it's something that they all had a hand in. Um, and, uh, and, you know, this weekend, I'm going to be thinking a lot about them and a lot of, and, and the hard work that they put in, you know, the, the Stephanie Bests, the Dottie Cups, the Janation Osters, the um, Lindy Oakley's, the um, Paisha Simmonses, uh, you know, uh, yeah, and it, well, she, you know, Shelby came much later, you know, but I think about the, those teams that were playing in that field, that's it, that was where one of the towers is now. Oh, yes. Um, yes. Stephanie Best told me about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and I'm, I'm thinking and I'm thinking of that. I'm thinking of uh, of them and, you know, Rochelle Schmidt and 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 the, the foundation that those players laid. And uh, uh, and wow, you know, I, I hope that if they get that, they all get the chance to see this. I mean, I hope as many of them get to come in person, but if they don't, they get to watch it on TV and see what they built, because it's, you know, I, you know, th that those are the people that I think of. Oh yeah. And, uh, and, and, you know, shout out to, you know, the players on the current team who did the legwork to get, you know, to, to, to get UCF good enough to this point, you know, they, they stand on the shoulders of giants too. And, uh, um, it's going to be uh, a great weekend. I don't read, there's a part, I mean, obviously I want UCF to win in advance to the super regionals, but there's a part of me that's like, I don't even care. I, I, I just want to, you know, experience that moment of watching, you know, a program, come from, you know, built from scratch to be on this stage. I think it's just remarkable. And, you know, I wish I could name them all, you know, right here, but, you know, unfortunately my memory fails me in my, in my old age, but uh, yeah, once again, Hey, congrats to UCF softball. What a moment. I was so glad I was there to see the, um, to see their, to see their name pop up as a host in that regional. What a moment that was. Uh, for UCF softball, so uh, that was that was incredible. I'm glad we got to see it. Oh yeah, it was nuts. It was a it was an amazing atmosphere to see that happen. I mean, there's a video of all of the team's reactions at throughout the night on the black and gold band. That was your video, and by the way, props to you for that video and everything you've been doing this week, but especially that because that that to me was the part of the story of that day that I think people miss. And if you get if you get the chance, go. Folks, listen, go and watch that video because it wasn't just, oh, UCF just seeing their, their name pop up, pop up on the screen. They knew the sequence of events that had to happen to give them a chance to host. 
And as the brackets were revealed, I was there with Eric. Eric was telling Cindy as everything was going on, like what he was seeing, what he was thinking would happen. And the players also knew. They knew the dominoes that had to fall. And that's why they were, you know, every reaction they had to every domino that fell for them. Yeah, it was an amazing reaction there. There was one, I will say there was one reaction that didn't make the video that I thought was quite funny when South Florida was revealed in the in the bracket they went ooh yeah i thought was yeah. Quite funny it didn't that make one the- that one and when wichita went up there did you notice that too yes i did I like did. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, hey, this team is nothing yeah. if not fun like this is a yeah. very fun team and you have to be I, yeah i mean I, I i when i was talking with stephanie best um and for the context for people that are listening to this episode because this is how things it sort of work. I had my interview with Stephanie Best on Wednesday afternoon, right after I finished that interview with her, because Eric was already at the Plex at the time. And so mm-hmm. I finished the interview with, with Stephanie Best and then immediately went to the Plex for the media availability with Cindy Ball Malone, the practice where I recorded segment one with Eric. And, th- and then right w- when we finished recording that segment, we had a media availability with three players, which you can see, which you can see on the black and gold banneret YouTube channel. But it, it is, but it, it's a very, it was a very busy softball day. It was amazing yeah. to see them, to see these players practice and get ready for such a big moment for this program. And I mentioned with Stephanie best, like, it's amazing to see how much this program has come in 20 years. I, after I, after we, like I turned the recording off, I mentioned to Stephanie, you know, being a sports reporter, I never really get to cover a, to cover things where I interview like legends of the, of a program that did their, you know, things in their heyday while I was alive. 2002 was when this program started. I was two years old when this program was oh my God. founded it's and it, so it was so old oh and my so God. it's insane how how much progress this program has made in such a in the relative grand scheme of things this short amount of time including with some players that the previous head coach coach Gillespie recruited now granted softball recruiting rules have changed somewhat but it's just amazing how well, how such a, with such, such a great foundation that this program was built with that we're able to get this. And it's a culmination of everybody that had a hand in from the players to coach Gillespie to coach bear. I mean, it, it's, it's honestly just amazing to see. And I really hope that the athletic department recognizes that and puts softball at the number two spot behind football, because it totally deserves it when it comes from a facilities. Yeah. Perspective. They've been, they've, they've, they really have, you know, just a remarkable, a remarkable journey. And the journey is not over. It's only just beginning. Speaking of journeys, by the way, uh, Bryson Turner, I wanted to uh, shift gears over to the other diamond and we'll talk about UCF baseball because they have an interesting path right now. Well, they're coming off of a uh, winning two out of three at Houston which uh, has been key, which was a really key series. And I wanted to go back and take a look. They've won, uh, let's see, two, two of three, three of four, um, three of their last four series in conference. And they're playing Cincinnati uh, Thursday, a doubleheader on Thursday, and then Saturday. They're expecting some bad weather on Friday. We talked, you guys talked about that in the softball segment. Um, but here's the situation for UCF uh, baseball. Now, ECU clinched the American regular season championship this past weekend. They have a four-game lead on Houston and UCF, who are tied right now. But UCF has the tiebreaker because they beat Houston two out of three. ECU is 17-4 and four in the league. Houston and UCF are 13-8. and eight. UCF this week plays Cincinnati, who is tied with Tulane for fourth in the league at 10 and 11. Again, this is uh, and this, this three game series. It's senior weekend. They're finishing it up here uh, at UCF um, in these final three games before the team goes out to Clearwater for the American Athletic Conference uh, Baseball uh, Championship. So. Here's the situation for UCF. They have to, they can clinch the number two seed uh, 
with, by just beating out Houston right now. Now, Houston is at ECU to finish the season. So they have a pretty tough task in front of them, uh, whereas UCF is playing a team that they're ostensibly ahead of in the standings. But, you know, the situation for UCF is pretty clear. They have to, they have to stay. you you got to win, I think, at least two out of three here to feel – you know, pretty good about maintaining that two seed. And if the season were over right now, Bryson, remember how the AAC tournament format is. There's two double elimination pods with four teams each. On one side, you have one, four, five, and eight, which is ECU, Tulane, Cincinnati, and South Florida. On the UCF side, that's actually the, the uh, to me is the tougher side because you would have right now you'd have Houston, U- or excuse me, UCF, Houston, Wichita State, and Memphis. All right. So to me, you know, th- 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 this is, I-, I think we can probably say this, you know, for sure, Bryson, is that this, this series is kind of like, yeah, you, it, it kind of doesn't really flow i mean i I think you want to avoid ecu so you want to stay in that two or three slot you don't want to drop to four or god forbid five you win one game you should that should you should take care of that by the way tulane who's in the four spot uh is taking on uh memphis at home so pretty good chance that tulane could sweep that series i think you need two out of three to be assured of that and then you avoid having to face ECU in, in the, in the top side of the bracket. On the other hand, though, Bryson, there's a part of me that says, you know, maybe you do want to face ECU at some point, because if you face them in, in that pod, remember the winners of the two pods play in a one in in a single game winner take off for the championship. You face ECU twice. It's going to help out your RPI a little bit, although UCF's RPI is, you know, pretty, it's not pretty great. You know, it will at least help you if you beat them twice, even if you lose in the championship game, if you beat ECU twice, I think you're in, you, you, you know, you could possibly, possibly help out your resume a little bit. So what's the plan right now for Greg Lovelady and UCF baseball heading into this final three games of the regular season? Well, I mean, one big thing they got to make sure to do is stay healthy because if there has been one narrative with this team, the entire season is that they have just been battered and bruised. When it comes to injuries. Now, I did hear from Love Lady that Alex Freeland is trying to work his way back for the conference tournament. He said that there was a 50 50 chance he could suit up this weekend, but he's really more aiming to have him be back for the conference tournament. So we'll see how that turns out. Now, obviously, the weather is going to end up being an obstacle. They already moved, moved, the, moved game two. To, to tomorrow for the double header. We're recording this on right. Thursday. So, but the Cincinnati team isn't exact, isn't a slouch. Now, while it does have the worst earned run average in the league, so their pitching has not done very well this season, their bats are the fourth best in the conference. They also have the, in, the, the conference's individual home run leader in Griffin Merritt. They also have two of the top 10 batting averages in the league in Joe Powell and Paul Comiestack, and if you and if he, and people might remember, Comiestack really grilled the, the this year's the, 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 the Knights in two out of th- four games in last year's regular season series with the Bearcats. So this te- this Cincinnati team is very much no slouch. And after and we actually talked with Love Lady. I I, I t- after the Bethune Cookman game was rained out. That was I'm telling you what the rain was coming down that night. But Lovely, yeah. Greg, Lovely was able to come out with us and talk to us for a while afterwards. And he had this to say when I was asking what he wants the, wants to see out of the team in this final series before going to the conference championship. What is something that you want to see this team do? Because obviously this is the last weekend before the conference tournament. So what is something that you want out of this team in the conference tournament that you, that you hope to see you know, work and develop? I want to stay team? healthy and get healthy um, as much as we possibly can. And two, just continue to play us. Um, you know, don't, we don't need to try to do more than what we've been doing. Uh, we don't need to have any heroes. And that's what we talked about even in the ninth inning of the uh, of the Saturday games. I, told them I, don't, I don't need any heroes. I just need to go up there and, and try to put together good at-bats and, and, and pass the baton to the next guy. We just need to do the same thing. Um, play good defense, but um, and, and 
get some guys in the game to pitch and get everybody rested for Tuesday. Um, but at the same time, like I, I don't, Ben Vesey's not going to go seven innings. So, um, but I don't care who's coming in after that. Like we got to be ready to pitch. Like whoever we put in there, we expect to be able to do do their job and do it to the best of their ability and help us win the games. And it doesn't change. I mean, everybody's probably going through the same thing at this time, just trying to set their rotation and set the plan up for the conference tournament. So we're all going to be in similar boats. So uh, just play our game. Uh, these games. We cannot go up with the mindset that these games don't matter because they do. Um, and whether, yeah, we lose all three, we're still going to the tournament and we can win the tournament, great. But it matters in terms of you never know. We talk about it all the time. You never know what a bat's going to be the lock sheen. You never know what inning it's going to be the lock sheen. What inning was it that David Litchell went out there and figured something out? What bullpen was it they went and figured something out? And if you figure it out in the, on Saturday in the champion, in the, uh, or Sunday in the championship of the conference, like, and that helps us win a championship, like, then that's when you figured it out. Like, you just never know. So we got to go out there and keep working, keep trying to get better. Uh, Tom Jostin, two weeks ago, I mean, he's hitting 220 or whatever, um, and something clicked. Whatever it was, it clicked. And we don't know what at bat. He might know, like, but it might, we don't know what game, what at bat, what batting practice, what day of practice that it clicked for him. And so whether that's – if somebody else is, like, in that situation and it clicks on Monday at practice for the conference tournament, then you better be going through – you better be getting working. You better not just go through the motions. So we don't want to get out of rhythm, and we want to try to make sure that we get guys in, in, as close to being their best as we possibly can. So these games continue to elevate us as we get closer to, to Tuesday. So they matter. Well, that was head coach Greg Lovelady after UCF's uh, 10-2 to victory over Bethune-Cookman at home on uh, Tuesday in five innings. Rain shortened, Bryson. Yes. Yes, indeed. I, I thank you very much, Coach Lovely, for coming out and talking to us for as long as he did, especially after a short, a short game. But I mean, I understand. They were up eight runs, you know, I mean, it was kind of oh. like, OK, this this is pretty. This is this. Is, they, they got they got at least they got the game to be official. You know, yeah, so. exactly. Literally. No, not even actually. What's funny is they were warming up for the sixth inning right as the lightning strike. So they literally it was that close. I'm putting my finger yeah. really close. It's that close to getting making sure that game was official. But uh, and you can watch the full lovely Greg Lovelady interview on the Black and Gold Banneret YouTube channel. But um one of the things he said in that in that full interview was that he really wanted to get allow some, some more guys to get some work in before the conference championship series. You want to make sure you have you have your guys fired up at all cylinders. But as you heard in the last clip, he also wants to make sure they're healthy because these series matter. This this series matters, even though it, even though the, the the quest for the number one seed is is all is now done and ECU has it. You, I mean, you, he, the biggest thing for me is that he talked about how you never really know when a player is going to click. You, um, he talked about Tom Jostin, how he started off this season in a slump, but lately he's, he's really been hitting the ball a lot better, a, a lot better now than he was before. And then David Litchfield. I mean, you look at where he was earlier on in, earlier on in the season. He was scuffling in the starting rotation. But during the Houston series, he came in for the first time in about a month. He had appearances of longer than two innings. And he ended up he and he ended up just absolutely killing it. He only ended up al allowing one run or no one hit one hit rather one hit the in just six and like 6.2 innings that he pitched And Litchfield and Jostin both ended up taking Amer the, the conference player of the player and pitcher of the year honors or pitcher of the week honors respectively. So this series is going to be very important for this team to be able to prepare themselves for the conference tournament, because just like last year, Nick Romano came back in the conference tournament and ended up having yeah. a great tournament. So having these games to, to get your reps in and prepare yourself and maybe be able to find something that gets you on a roll for the conference tournament is crucial because this team definitely needs it. And I do agree with you though, that avoiding ECU is probably a good idea because every other series, every other opponent, I think is a, is a toss up. And in my opinion, you want to be able to be as prepared as you possibly can if you want to go up against ECU again. Yeah, and I'm looking, by the way, this is such a tough needle for a love lady to thread this weekend because of the schedule. We're kind of playing the whole thing by ear here where they're planning on doing a doubleheader Thursday. They're going to reportedly, the way it looks is they're going to evaluate whether they can finish the series on Friday, but if it gets washed out, they'll try and finish it on Saturday. 
And the reason why this is hard is you got to manage your pitching staff before you head to Clearwater. Ben Vespi is listed as the guy who's going to get game the ball in the first game of the doubleheader. But we don't know who's going to start game two, and we don't know who's going to start the third game whenever that happens. What do you think is going to happen? Well, Love Lady has said that he wants to have Connor Stain throw at some point this weekend. Not a long, not a long start, but you want to be, uh, but obviously he's been kind of coming in and out in of series lately. And so you want to be able to have him just get some reps in before he goes to the conference tournament where it's basically all or nothing at that point. I think when, it, when if Stain goes in the conference championship, they're going to try to throw him for as much as his uh, blistered finger is going to let him. So but so for now, but you obviously want to make sure he warms himself up for that. And so if, if it were me, I would maybe start staying in game two just in case. But who who knows? I mean, this what this weather really does complicate the situation. And you and you definitely want to make sure that you, you you're all set for the for the conference tournament pitching wise. And the way this bullpen has been, it's been very inconsistent. You don't you have it. And that's another thing he met, love lady mentioned is consistency. He really wants to get these 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 bullpen pitchers consistent for the conference tournament. And is it gonna is it gonna happen? Who knows? It really depends on if they click, and that's what he's hoping is going to happen in the Cincinnati series. Better to have those three games to hopefully three games if weather permits to mm-hmm. let these guys click, so that way they can be the best to play the best of their ability in the conference tournament and. That happened last year, and we managed to get all the way to the championship game as a fifth seed. So it looks like we're probably going to have to see something like that happen again in in order for us to not only get to the championship game, but to get a playoff slot. Because more than likely, with the way the league has been, it seems likely that this is going to be a one big bid league with the automatic qualifier, the winner of the tournament, getting in. So winning the conference tournament is paramount above all else and basically everything and basically these three games are preparing yourself as much as you possibly can for a run at that all right so uh once again three game series keep an eye on ucf underscore baseball on twitter they have the latest stuff that's up there uh, as far as the schedule is going to be um and then when uh, you know however this goes uh the baseball tournament begins on the 24th, which is Tuesday in Clearwater at Bay Care Ballpark. All eight teams will play on that first day, that Tuesday, starting at 9 a.m., which would be the 4 or 5. And again, like I mentioned, Bryson, there is a possibility that UCF could fall as far as the 4 or the 5. Um, they could, however, end up being in the second bit, which would be uh, two or three, which would play in either the third or the fourth game uh, on Tuesday. And then from there, like we said, it's two pods of double elimination. Uh, and, you know, from there, it's, uh, it, yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be, who knows uh, how this is going to turn out. But the the primary, the prime directive for UCF right now is stay healthy, stay fresh, get to clear water with a full complement of arms and then try and win that first game so that you get that day off and you don't have to cut because the way that the tournament is arranged. Remember, if you lose, you got to come back the next day. If you win, you get to, you get a day off the way everything kind of shakes out, um, which I think is kind of cool how they arrange it like that. So uh, it, because the, the only way realistically for UCF to get to the NCAA tournament is to win this is to win the American tournament. So uh, that's 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 what lays before them uh, right now. All right. Should be fun. Um, song yes, song yeah. At the same time. I know it's going to be wild. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we get back. We owe a shout out to UCF track for doing for making history happen this year. And head coach Dana Boone uh, and her team uh, winning both the indoor and the outdoor championships this spring we're going to recap their performance in the outdoor conference championships and get a look at uh their outlook heading forward as they head to the ncaa's and some news from some other sports as well when we return this is the black and gold banneret podcast we're back after this we're back here on the black and gold banneret podcast jeff sharon and bryson turn with you as we wrap up 
And we got to talk about UCF track and field. They have done it. They've done the double. They win the outdoor championship uh, in Wichita and get the sweep outdoor and indoor uh, this year. Coaching, coaching staff of the year to UCF track. Uh, wow, what a job done by Dana Boone and her assistants, Brian Jackson and Glenn Smith. And uh, UCF really, Bryson, owned the team competition, 163 points, uh, uh, which was nearly 60 better than Houston at 105.5. Uh, gold medalists, including Renaya Jones in the 100 hurdles, as one would expect. Latasha Smith in the 400, uh, Selena Wright in the 400 hurdles. Um, UCF won the four by one relay, the four by four relay. Uh, top three finishes for Latasha Smith, Renaya Jones in there, and the 200 and 100, respectively. Uh, three, four in the high jump with Kalia Jones and uh, Natalia Madison. Charlotte Crook was on the podium um in the in the 15 in the uh in the mile at 425 38 wow running the mile um just an all-around fantastic performance uh by UCF uh to capture the uh, outdoor track and field championship and the birth in the NCAAs oh yes and don't forget about the trot because those were just triumphs on the last day of the championship don't that's forget, right yeah don't forget Brittany the Floyd or Brittany Floyd got yeah, Brittany Floyd got first place in the heptathlon, heptathlon. Natalia Madison ended up coming in in fourth, breaking her own freshman record in the in the category, mm-hmm. by the way. Jasmine mm-hmm. Scott Kilgo got the bronze in the long jump. And then Brenna Mullaney got the, the bronze in the 3,000 meter steeplechase, which apparently a lot of the distance runners were very excited about on Twitter. So, yeah, this was a very dom- dominant performance from UCF at least at very much at least in the track categories the track categories and the jumps were the major the, the major points getters for the team here and they ended up getting the most points in an American Athletic Conference outdoor championship meet in the meets history that's how wow. dominant this this team coach Dana Boone's team was in the in this ter- in this in this meet and I mean, it was really amazing to watch. I mean, obviously, with how how much this this um, team leans on its track athletes, they did fall behind very late because a lot of the field events obviously wrapped up on day one on days one and two. But once those track events hit, the points just kept coming for UCF at for UCF athletes until it got to where it is now. But an absolutely well done performance from there. I think um, we're the 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 selection for the East preliminary, the NCAA East preliminary is going to be released on Thursday. They're going to be releasing, we're recording this Wednesday. So that means the selections are going to be released sometime tomorrow for the East preliminary. And I think we're going to be seeing a good amount of athletes heading there. So not, not just including Renaya, Latasha. I imagine Brittany Floyd will be among those as well. I could imagine a relay team going, going as well. I mean, there's no shortage of amazing athletes on, of amazing athletes on this team. This is UCF's first outdoor championship uh, since they were it, it, as a part of the American. The last time they won it was the nice last year in Conference USA when they also pulled the double. That was back in 2013. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, uh, again, this was uh, the closest UCF came. They had a couple of second place finishes in 2014 and 2016. Um, things kind of bottomed out in 2018 with a 10th place finish, but again, credit to Dana Boone and her staff who, uh, you know, rebuilt this team and, uh, got them to a first place finish and winning the double in 2022. So congrats to the Knights on that. And it's a pretty quick turnaround too, Bryce. And they only have about what one week, a little bit more than a week before the, uh, the national East preliminary, which is, uh, in, uh, which is on Thursday, uh, May the 26th, uh, or at least it starts Thursday, May the 26th. So, um, to, 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 to listen, it's, it's no rest for the weary. Here. <laughs> like they gotta, they gotta prepare for the nationals real quick. Well, at the very least of those that will be selected to it, they're, um, obvious, uh, obviously it depends on if you're selected to it. Um, I, I would imagine that am I uh, that you that you know obviously there's a few athletes that we know are probably going to be selected for sure like Renaya Jones and Latasha Smith Latasha Smith and then after that 
I, it, it depends on how hot on how high like the fast times that, that people mm-hmm. were able to run a share Collins, of course, made it to the national championship last year. So there's obviously a possibility for her. Adrian Adams, of course, set the new school record in the discus throw. She's also a candidate to go for that for that event. I mean, it re- obviously we have Brittany Floyd with the heptathlon as well. I wouldn't be surprised if Natalia Madison potentially got a bid as well. So it, and then, of course, the two relay teams, which among them being Kia Williams, who got a silver in the four in the 400 meter dash. So it's not just Latasha doing well in that event as well. So there um, we I mean, we talked about a lot about Renaya Jones last year just because of how of just how thoroughly she broke out into mm-hmm. being like the face of this team. But while she off, while she still very much improved this season, at least as a sprinter. I think that a big thing with the, the big thing with this track team is that it's grown beyond Renaya because we've seen new school records set in plenty of other events from the heptathlon to the 400 meter to 400 meter dash to the discus throw. We're we are now seeing like this entire if Renaya Jones broke out last year, the entire team is breaking out, or at least a good majority of it is breaking out this season. And it's been quite the sight to see. I'll tell you that. I mean, and especially with props to Dana Boone, who was actually hurt during the course of this season. She was moving around. I remember back in the, uh, one of our home meets. So we, I, we talked to her post meet and she had, and she had a boot on and was getting around via a cart. So, so props to, to coach Boone and her staff for incredibly well coached season as well. And I think that she's definitely a, I mean, another line in what are proving to be some really good UCF track coaches since uh, Carol Smith Gilbert. Yeah. So UCF athletes, not done in track and field. We'll be following uh, and, and hopefully getting a, so, you know, the finalized list of who is going to be qualified for the NCAAs. Uh, in due time. You know who else is not done, Bryson? Marie Mattel of UCF Women's Tennis. Now, the, the, t- the team competition is over, but Marie uh, gets to play in the singles championships, and that starts uh, this coming Monday. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Marie Mattel is going to be starting in the NCAA Singles Women's Tennis Championship on Monday. So um, she ended up, she ended up being the automatic qualifier for the American athletic conference in that tournament. I don't believe we have a bracket yet for that. Uh, at least one that I haven't found at the moment, but once she, do, um, but once she does start competing, I will be following that and updating on my Twitter account at it's Bryson Turner. So rest assured when that's happening, I will keep, keep everyone up to date on that front. But I mean, the good with Marie, Obviously, best of luck to her. This is an amazing opportunity for, for, for her there. And I'm excited to see what she can do with it. Yeah. All right. So we had a couple of a couple of teams end their seasons uh, this past weekend as well. The men's golf team in the NCAA New Haven Regional finished uh, plus 14, ninth place. So they do not advance, unfortunately, to the NCAA championships. It was looking, they were, they were right there with it. Bryson had a difficult second round that ended their season or a different fi- difficult final round I should say yes difficult final round is so um because when you look at it they finished 14 over for the tournament they were 16 over in the final round so they were under par to start the day and they just ended up having a bad day everyone did which mm-hmm. I mean sometimes you get those on the golf course unfortunately but um, but you know, I, it was rough because like that first they had they got up to such a good start. You know, they everyone shot seventy or under in that first round. Yeah, first time uh, they shot it. Yeah, time they shot a two seventy six in the first round, two eighty two in the second round. Um, but then yeah, the final round was just rough. They went two ninety six to finish at eight fifty four, which we, as you said was plus fourteen. Yeah, it's unfo- it's unfortunate, but I mean. I think that that be a, b- besides that last round, this was a solid appearance. They managed to put themselves in the hunt on, on, in, in, within striking distance for two out of the three days. And unfortunately, they just had a bad day on that on that third day. But the way this this team has played this season, the fact that they managed to make it to this regional in the first place is a very well done, a very well done accomplishment. Like this was not exactly a very good team 
for, the, for a good year for this team. And so the fact that they still managed to play well enough to get in to this New Haven regional, what we talked about it um, the week, a week back, a couple weeks back when it was first announced that there was a team ranked ahead of them on the golf sap rankings that wasn't selected as a team. So it was mm-hmm. right on the bubble. So I think in my opinion, considering this, the season we're in right now, it was a very it was a very good accomplishment to make it to the regional in the first place. Hopefully next year will be will will be better because obviously there'll be some more development development in there. But I think that for for I think really this this regional really kind of encapsulated this team season. They managed to put themselves in a position to succeed early on they just weren't really able to close the deal unfortunately yeah uh another team that you know again came up a little bit short in uh, in their final event of the season rowing uh in the four main events uh ucf finished in second place to the champions from smu congrats to smu uh they got the job done for the second year in a row winning the american athletic conference uh rowing championships um yeah, and listen, we deserve, you know, the, the the folks on the rowing team and, you know, and head coach Becky Kramer, hey, props to them as always. You know, it, it's you know, the work that they put in um, is amazing. And, and, you know, you hope that they're at least proud of their accomplishment. Although knowing Becky, I'm sure that they're probably like, you know, something we got to get back to the top of that podium because um, I know how, how competitive they were. They just came up a little bit short against SMU. Oh, yeah. This was deja vu, Jeff, because this is the exact same result that the team had last year with SMU right. sweeping all four, sweeping all four races and UCF sweeping all four second place second places. So it's very interesting because this SMU program has definitely really built up its rowing program very well, very well. And so now the ball is firmly, in, firmly in Becky Kramer's court here because now it's like, all right, how do I respond to this? The good news is is that she has a couple of return of returning rowers to help her out um of sophomore tegan fuchs on the varsity eight boat was named to the all-conference for first team and an, and and then another another sophomore uh charlotte wiley on the varsity four boat was named to the all-conference second team so you have a couple of rowers on these two different boats that are going to be returning next year and i think that having that type type of young talent is definitely going to help them however they um there are also a few more um emily puya puya got selected into the uh, to the all conference first team she was on the varsity eight boat as well and then two more varsity eight rowers anna kaiser gallego and uh, graduate student coxswain lauren roman from the varsity eight boat were named to the all conference second team so nice done for those ladies for being recognized for the conference but for fuchs and but for fuchs and wiley uh, this is def- this is something that they hopefully they'll be able to build off of head- heading into next season because now I think the I think the big the big question now is what can you we do to catch up to SMU next year because I think that's going because obviously this is also the last year in the American if they if we manage to get, get to the Big Twelve by 2023 so in the one or one or two seasons or two that we have left in the American the question is is can we go out on top against SMU. And I'm very interested to see how this program does that. All right. One last little bit that we wanted to talk about real quick that uh, in the, if you can check the UCF football transfer portal tracker uh, as we wrap, interesting, we're wrapping up with football, which is something we rarely do, but uh, some interesting news that dropped this week, you know, obviously UCF is having some trouble trying to fill out that linebacker position. They're a little thin at linebacker right now, but they, uh, some, Pretty quick back-to-back news. Uh, the first thing was initially UCF had gotten a commitment from Chris Mole, who is a two-time first all first team, uh, first team all-conference USA linebacker at UAB, had initially committed to UCF, announces he's no longer transferring to UCF a couple days ago on Monday. And uh, cue the Twitter outrage, obviously. But lo and behold, just a few hours later. UCF gets a key pickup at linebacker and sophomore Brandon Jennings, who came uh, from Maryland via Kansas State. Uh, eight games last year, played, uh, picked up 23 tackles. He's a big kid, 6'3", 235. So as we look at the linebacker transfers this year, all right, Bryson, Brandon Jennings, Jason Johnson, 
OVC leader in tackle in, in tackles from Eastern Illinois, senior coming in. Uh, KD McDaniel from Kentucky, three-star recruit. Terrence Lewis, five-star recruit out of Maryland. So they're trying to fill this linebacker spot. It's going to be a lot of new faces right there, but Jennings is going to help out significantly. I think that the, I think the main, the main issue right now, Brandon or, or Bryson is, is Brandon going to be eligible for this season? Because we're not hundred percent sure on that. Right. Yes, that is correct because he already used his one-time transfer with immediate eligibility to go to Kansas state. But now that he's right. coming here, he doesn't have that anymore, which means he, if he's going to play immediately, he has to get a waiver which you're not, it's not a guarantee that he's going to get. So, and then of course, there's the case of the controversy with Terrence Lewis recently. There's that. I mean, it's no wonder why UCF is, uh, has made another offer. I, be- I believe I saw he made, they made another offer to a, line, a, a linebacker transfer on Twitter last I, last I looked earlier. So this linebacker is positioned is definitely something that, Gus Malzahn is probably going to look to um, improve on as much as he can before the or tra- before the season arrives. And then even when it does, I mean, there is some question marks th- there. Because I mean, aside from Jeremiah Jean Baptiste, who I think is definitely going to probably be a beacon of leadership for this room. It's um, you have the you have all these new transfers coming in, but you also have the issue of is Brandon Jennings going to play? What's going to happen with Terrence Lewis? So mm-hmm. it's it's I think that that's definitely going to be a question to have for defensive coordinator Travis Lewis once the season starts getting under underway in the fall. But I mean, the good news is is that this team is trying. The fact that they lost a linebacker and then hours later managed to announce the addition uh, got the, gotten the addition of a new one is really showing how much they are working to try and fix this and if, yeah. if there's nothing if there's anything you that you can't accuse Gus Malzahn and Tra- Travis Williams and this coaching staff are it's a lack of effort yeah the uh linebacker that you were talking about that UCF offered just hours ago was uh Diamante Tucker Dorsey uh, who was an All-American at the FCS level for James Madison. 116 Eric. tackles, two and a half sacks, four picks, nine tackles for loss last season. So, you know, if they're able to snag him, that could, that would be another big pickup for uh, UCF uh, as well. So, um, so yeah, we're, we continue to wait and see on that and see if UCF can bolster that linebacking core as we head into the off season, but our, again, overall, we're not in the off season yet because we have NCAA softball coming to UCF this weekend. Stay with us throughout the weekend for coverage of the NCAA regionals in Orlando. Follow Bryson at it's Bryson Turner, Eric at Eric Lopez Elo. Follow us collectively at UCF banner at underscore SBN. You can follow me at Jeff underscore Sharon, uh, as well. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash black and gold banner. And of course, always at black and gold banneret.com. We are your home for UCF sports on SB nation. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast. If you don't already on Android and Apple devices. Uh, and if you do subscribe to us, leave us a rating. Tell us how we're doing. Bryson big ups to you this weekend for absolutely killing it out there. I know you got a big weekend coming up with softball as well. And Big huge thanks to you for everything and baseball. Thank big huge thanks to you for everything that you've been working. We may have some weather to contend with this weekend, but uh, hopefully the uh, the weather gods will smile upon us at least a little bit. We can see uh, and and it won't wreck everything completely. We'll have to see. It's going to be rough, but hey, I know no matter what happens, I know you're going to be there. Yes, indeed, I am very excited to to see it i mean looking at how the the plex transformed i'm very excited to see it just pack with fans oh, the fans hopefully on friday night and weather again weather permitting like we started so i'm mm-hmm. i'm very i'm very excited i'm excited to see if baseball can be able to pull it all together against cincinnati this weekend get ready for the conference tournament and then of course track is and then of course track is getting ready 
for the East preliminary for whoever gets selected. So I, I mean, it's, this is, I would say kind of, it's one of those times where you're just putting in that last ditch, like full sprint to the finish line. I feel like rich strike and the Kentucky to Kentucky Derby where I'm kind of, where, you know, you, you kind of slow down just a little bit and then you just put it all into high gear at the very end. So yeah, it's I'm gonna very, be, it's going to be fun. All right. Let's uh, let's go ahead and put a bow on this one. Bryson, job well done. Thank you also so much for listening. 